And so abstracting the concept of an ion channel is a little conductor allows us to construct an equivalent circuit for the cell. We have the outside of the cell, an external solution, which is a salt solution, a pretty good conductor. That's this wire here. We have the inside of the cell, also a pretty good conductor. That's this wire here. We have the individual potassium channels, which are either conducting or not conducting. If a channel is conducting, we say it's open, and this switch would be closed. I know that's a bit confusing, but that's the way it goes. When this switch is open, we say that the channel is closed because there's no conducting pathway. Now, the great, and in addition to this conductor and the switch, we have a battery, which is simply the Nernst potential for the channel. In this case, the Nernst potential for potassium. Now, because conductors add in parallel, we can say that the entire membrane has a number, a large number, of these individual potassium channels in parallel. Cells have tens or hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of individual single molecule potassium channels in parallel. Each one of them has a switch, which says whether the channel is active or not active, and each one of them has its battery, which is its Nernst potential. And so we can say that there is a macroscopic conductance, which is the sum of all of the microscopic conductances. We call the microscopic conductances gamma, Greek for a little g, and the macroscopic conductances a um, big G. And so the big G is the sum of all of the little gammas whose switches allow the channel to open. And so for every switch whose channel is functioning, we add that gamma to get the macroscopic potassium conductance. Now in this membrane, we have potassium channels, which are uh, be underlying the resting potential. But the membrane usually also has sodium channels. And so we have a macroscopic sodium conductance, which is the sum of the little gammas of sodium channels that happen to be functioning at any given moment. Those little gammas all add in parallel. The gamma for sodium is not usually equal to the gamma for potassium. And the Nernst potential for sodium is around plus 60 millivolts, as opposed to the Nernst potential for potassium, which is around minus 90 millivolts. So we can abstract a cell into an equivalent circuit that has a large number of individual molecules, each of which is a potassium channel, and a large number of individual molecules, each of which is a sodium channel, producing summed conductances for sodium and potassium. Now there are also ions for other, there are also channels for other ions and there's capacitance which we will not worry about during this particular lecture. So we can abstract further and say that because a large number of individual channels act uh, some in parallel if their switches allow them to, we have a variable total conductance and so that will G be GNA in series with the Nernst potential for sodium and a variable potassium conductance in series with a Nernst potential for potassium. Here we have the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell. And so this becomes a very convenient way of calculating voltages, calculating the resting potential of a cell. Let's remember that this is a slightly more physical picture of a cell. We have the potassium channels in green, which are usually open, each of which has its little gamma. We have sodium channels that are sometimes open. They all have their little gammas as well. And here we make a key uh, point. We make the point of conservation of charge, or Kirchhoff's current law. 
and we say that a charge that flows in through a sodium channel must be balanced by flowing out through a potassium channel. Now this is actually fairly subtle because the ion that's carrying the current outward is a potassium ion and the ion that's carrying the current inward is a sodium ion and the cell eventually needs to exert some energy to put those sodium ions back where they belong and those potassium ions back where they belong. But that's not our concern at the moment. Our concern at the moment is that charge gets conserved, meaning that the current loop is finished, the current loop is complete, and we don't have any extra charge going off and not getting returned. Now this allows us actually with the equivalent circuit on the upper left here and Kirchhoff's law down here, this allows us to calculate the resting potential for a cell that has potassium channels and sodium channels in a way that does depend on having belief in the electrical circuit. Okay, and so these abstractions lead very nicely and rather simply to an equation for the resting potential at steady state. Remember, it's not an equilibrium uh, because the cell is pumping all of those ions back. Here's the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell, and we see that the resting potential is a weighted sum of the Nernst potential for potassium times its conductance plus the Nernst potential for sodium times its conductance. At rest, mostly potassium channels are open, so this, the potassium terms dominate, and we have a resting potential which is very near EK, very near the resting potential for potassium. But if sodium channels are open, and this happens during the action of uh, drugs at postsynaptic membranes, if sodium channels are open, then we have a membrane potential that becomes nearer to the sodium uh, or Nernst potential. And so this is how we can change the voltage across a biological membrane, how nature changes the voltage across a biological membrane with drugs that open ion channels. So excitatory postsynaptic responses, sodium channels open too. So there are two major roles for ion channels in drugs and the brain. At synapses, which we've discussed in this lecture, we have a neurotransmitter or an agonist changing ion channels from closed to open and changing the potential across the cell. And the importance of changing the potential across the cell is that this changes the frequency of action potentials. In addition, at axons and cell bodies, uh, drugs can change the equilibrium between closed and open voltage-gated channels, and we will talk about that in future lectures. Now we're ready to talk in more detail about agonists at ligand-gated channels.